Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful to be able to be gathered with you here this morning. Let's turn our hearts, our minds, to the worship of Almighty God on this day. Please join me in the call to worship when we are lonely and feeling lost. Jesus calls us and brings us hope and peace. When we are angry and frustrated. Jesus heals our wounds and soothes our tempers. When we are sorrowful and broken. Jesus binds up our wounds with his healing love. Come, let us worship the one who cares so abundantly for us.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of freedom, set at liberty, we are who captive and grant us absolution. As we confess our sin, prisoners by self-interest, we disregard neighbors, we bolster our own egos at others' expense. We, when slander is rampant, we seldom stop it. When rumors are rife, we seek not the source. Help us to check our destructive ways, lest we consume one another, and cause us to use our freedom in more loving ways. Please hear the assurance of forgiveness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. We who belong to Christ, Jesus has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Therefore, let us live in love and bear one another's burdens in the assurance that we are forgiven and made alive in the Spirit. For Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
Hear this invitation to our offering. God of abundance, sometimes we have to learn how to have faith in the in-between. When there doesn't seem to be enough, show us how your people take care of each other. When we fear to share what we have, show us the grace of receiving an unexpected gift. And when we hang on tight for later, just in case, show us that you are in this very moment. In these ways, teach us to give, to share, to offer ourselves for your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in a time of prayer. Lord God, some of us pray on our knees, some of us with hands folded, some of us with our palms to our hearts, our foreheads to the ground, some with a sign of protest raised, some gritting teeth, some with eyes tightly shut, and others lighting a candle. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us in these tumultuous times. You are the hope of every soul. Strengthen us in this hour of worship. Take us to that rock that is beyond the reach of our enemies. Be, O oh God, our high tower that we might be free from sin that pursues us. Sweep clean our vision, heavenly God, that we may clearly distinguish the truth from the untruth the high from the low, the clean from the unclean, the enduring from the transient. May we, through your guidance, be able to set aside our confusion and bewilderment and find the path where your word is a lamp to our feet. O oh Lord, may our faith in you increase. Many times darkness creeps in because the events of our lives are so overpowering and imprisoning the weight and the burden of our existence becomes hard for us to bear. Lord, strengthen us. We ask that you would have mercy. Bring your compassion and your comfort. For those who have deep sadness, come and meet them. For those who are struggling with anger, be with them. For those who are dealing with hatred, show them a new way. For those who are indifferent or have resignation or are skeptical or in denial, be their counsel and their guide. Lord, we pray for all of those this day who are trying to shepherd funds into different places around the world where there is the most need. We pray for the jobless. We pray for those in broken homes. We lift up those who are homeless. For those who are struggling because they don't have sufficient medical resources available to them. We fear for epidemics and outbreaks, all these words that have become common to us in our language. Lord, hear our voices in prayer. Amplify our gifts. We are grateful for healthcare workers, for those who are strong of will and heart, and for their training. Guide them as they deliver care around the world. Encourage and protect and bless them in their often dangerous work. Help us, Lord, to be witnesses of compassion and patience to those around us. Help us to seek clarity of mind and to let impulses pass, replacing them with wisdom and improved judgment. Help us not to turn off our senses of caring in the face of all of the things that are deeply troubling to us. Restore our values that unity and faith are the tinder for our goodness and for the creativeness of the image you have given us. Help us to focus on simple acts of the heart. 
knowing that our words matter, what we read matters, what we say matters. Help us to be those people who provide words that ease tensions, soften our touch and lessen our anger. We pray for places around the world where people are working together uh, to come up with solutions that will save lives. We pray for those who are the most vulnerable and those who are struggling. Lord God, we come to you this day with the needs of our community. And so we pause for a moment as each of us shares those things that are heavy on our hearts. Lord, particularly this day, we thank you for your servant, Betty Wagaman from the Charleroi congregation. We thank you, Lord, for her faithfulness and that in your mercy, you welcomed her home. We pray for those who grieve her and who will miss her. And we ask God that you would meet them with an extra measure of your compassion. Be with those who are struggling with tests, waiting test results, those who are in the midst of recuperating, and those who have shown great promise in their recuperation. Continue to grant them your strength and your peace and your power. Lord, we bring all of the things that we have heavy on our hearts and the joys that we share, those celebrations that have occurred. As we are coming to the end of the summer and as this Labor Day weekend is here, we pray for the works of our hands, for the gifts that you have given us that we are able to share. We pray for our school teachers and for our, for our school students. We lift up all of the other concerns that we have going on around us. We pray, Lord, for our nation and for its leaders. We ask all of these things confident in your power and in your plan for us, in your love and in your determination to disciple and shepherd us through anything that we might face. And so now hear us as we unite our voices using that prayer that you gave us, Jesus, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Listen to this reading from God's Word, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We wonder how many obituaries in the newspaper should actually read like this. Robert Jackson died yesterday after a lifetime of doing junk that he really didn't want to do. His condition was further complicated because he failed to do much, if anything, that he did want to do. Experts reported that he died 20 years too early from cramming someone else's ideas of life into his brain, his body, and his everyday being. Attempts by Mr. Jackson to fill the void with work or with cars or with excess eating or alcohol or wives or girlfriends or meeting someone else's expectations or ignoring his wife and kids while being in front of the TV were all dismal failures and unsuccessfully. Successful. Miserable in the last years, he passed away unpeacefully yesterday at his home. He was surrounded by colleagues from work that he hated and were after his job and family members who were just as miserable as he was. Can people really change? That's the question. Can life really be different than what it is right now? If you walk into a bookstore or more likely these days, look on Amazon you'll find self-help titles shouting at you. What should I do with my life? You can heal your life. You can be happy no matter what. Controlling people or controlling people. Outer, order, inner, calm. A food science book that we ran, a call, ran across called How Not to Die. The Miracle Morning if you do a Google search of the most popular self-help book, what you get to come back is not just one book, but a list of the top 30 self-help books. You see, there are a lot of people out there trying to sell you an answer based on taking control of your life, getting your own needs met, building your self-confidence. But really, why would you believe you could change by putting confidence in yourself. I mean, you and I both know that we're fallible, we're easily tempted. And this is the topic of countless conversations and debate, ongoing conversations with friends inside marriages, sometimes just in passing, oh yeah, he or she is never gonna change. To that nearly desperate or downright despairing plea, this is never going to change. My life is always going to be this way. The question is, is it really possible to change human nature? And if we ask that, there are really two groups. One group of people who are impatient with their own progress and those who are frustrated by the progress of others. But you can't change by sheer willpower. Look at the trail of broken New Year's resolutions every single year. Those unused exercise machines, that diet book that has already gotten dusty. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different change or outcome. Plus our frustration of trying to change someone else, which never works, leaves us with the belief that people really can't change. Well, we have to tell you that that's wrong. Can people change? Well, it's not much of a sermon if we say <laughs> no 
kind of say, go on your way and your miserable life and you know, heaven's going to be a lot better. Yes, absolutely, positively. We've witnessed it in our lives and other people's lives, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit as we believe in Jesus Christ. Also, not much of a sermon if we say, yes, we can change and just go along in your life and be a better Christian and just try harder. As we prayed about this sermon and we read God's word and we studied, here's what really broke through to us, revolutionized how we thought about this issue of change. We tend to think of our true selves as the way we appear, the way we've known ourselves and others to be. That's why believing that someone or ourselves or someone else can go from being hot-tempered or indifferent or unaffectionate or frustrating or compulsive or addicted to substances, they can't change, it's impossible because these things are really who they are, who they've always been. And we think that we've got that totally backward and wrong. Look with us at how God created us because that's who we truly are. He knew us before the world was formed. He prepared us to do wonderful things. He made us in his image. He delights in us. We're priceless. We people were created by God all the intended wholeness that we've just distorted. How can we change ourselves? Well, the answer is that we can't. Only Christ can by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The goal of human nature is to be truly human, fully human. The glory of Christ is a person fully alive, reaching full potential, recreated in Christ's image. Whatever we do or have done to escape or distort what God created us to be ends up in sin and inhumanity. Selfishness, self-centeredness makes us less than the human beings that God says that we are. The only way to change human nature is to remove the distortions. In a nutshell, outside Christ, our fallen nature is in rebellion against God. We seek to run our own lives. This results in pride and anger and self-absorption and hostility and competitiveness. When Christ takes hold of our life, he makes us more human. It's a huge difference. It's not that we have to change the basics of who we are. It's that we have to get rid of all of the stuff we've put and distorted on top of the original person. It's throwing out all the junk, all the things that happened to us or that we did, things that God added on. It's a falsehood that to become more like Christ is to be spiritual or less human. God created us in our bodies in this world. So often we think that to become a Christian, we have to take on some kind of super pious mentality. But what we end up with is not humanness, but an escape from it. As we become more like him, we don't become some angelic being hovering between heaven and earth. We become human beings, compassionate, perceptive, feeling, caring, loving people. The reproduction of Christ's character in us enables us to be authentically human. Our human nature is returned to its original. It's like the analogy of a beautiful painting, a masterpiece, a piece of art that has been painted over and seemingly has a different picture and is, is useless by comparison. This is a process that we now see in the mirror dimly but then we'll see face to face. Can people really change? Well, we've done it. We've changed the original that God gave us to begin with. That's the point. There's a huge difference between trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, so to speak, and to reclaim what is already there. Try this metaphor. Let's say we're talking about your house. And what you really, really want is an intricate hardwood floor. And what you have is an orange shag carpet. Now, if you love orange shag carpets, just play along. This is an old orange shag carpet. You can see that in your head. It's stained with heaven knows what. The dogs peed on it. 
you got the picture. Does this image, though, look like any part of your life? Well, if you're honest, and if we are, yeah, it does. It's a process that there's something underneath that. And so you strip off the orange carpeting, and then you take up the linoleum, and then the plywood, and then the subflooring, and then the paint to reveal that gorgeous inlaid hardwood floor that was there to begin with. But we can't just sit around and say, yep, I've got a fabulous parquet floor underneath that floor right there. No, you have to get up. You have to participate in what the Holy Spirit is seeking to do in you. It's important to remember that it's the Holy Spirit giving the power that's going to change us, that's going to make that restoration happen. It is he who began a good work in us, who will see it through to completion, Scripture says. God won't give up on his purpose to make us perfect. Make no mistake, though, you can't do it yourself. It actually isn't a DIY project that you can YouTube or watch on some television show. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are to do and to seek godly wisdom and approach that in participating in this transformation of our very selves. Nothing against those self-help books or books about change, about transformation. We read lots of Christian books about transformation. But the focus can't be on ourselves or getting your own needs met. The focus has to be on the right person, on God, and growing into all the things that Christ has made you to be. And then those behavioral change-up tips that you might read in a self-help book, well, they might help along the way to shed some of the junk. Mm -hmm. But our focus, the power, is based on a scriptural truth, like what you might say. That Christ is the center, the foundation of the universe, and it's not me, it's not you, it's not our needs, it's not our wants, it's not our desires. That we are created so precious and so gifted and so loved by our Father and Savior that we can scarcely imagine that when we believe in Jesus Christ and let him have reign over our lives, that we are given by the coming and the living of the Holy Spirit all that awesome power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Not a sliver of it, not a smidgen of it, all of it. And so then there is no situation, no person that is hopeless. We look at the metaphor of a house, for instance, that there are some rooms in your house or mine that maybe we keep for company or we have them closer to perfect so they're ready for company to come in. But there are other places that only certain people, especially family, see. We have to be willing to do the hard work to change, wanting something to be different, but not willing to do the hard work. We have to be willing to do the hard work. And so it's not so much that I do it, is that I take away the walls, uh, right. the obstacles, and the disobedience to the Spirit doing the work. It's not so much that I'm going to set to work to make myself a more loving and wonderful wife. It's that I'm going to be more obedient to God's word and less self-centered. Look, I know reality. I know what it's like to say um, husbands and wives and family members and friends just looking in the mirror at ourselves. This feels or can feel hopeless. He's never going to change. She's never going to love me. He cares about himself and only himself. Why won't she listen or care or respond? He's never going to stay sober. She's never going to stay clean. She's always going to care more about and on and on and on. But God's words are practical and powerful and effective. 
we're, we're called to first open up those rooms or closets or areas of our lives, and we all know what that is, to the power of the Spirit to do the hard work of cleaning out the junk. We take hope and encouragement from the truth that if one person makes a change, then the whole system changes. Everything changes when even one person starts to change. And that we don't get to go into other people's lives and change them or rearrange them. It's important and crucial to remember that we can help and hold others accountable as they choose to change. But nothing that we do can make someone else change. We're responsible for only for ourselves. Consider this. If God has put something in your life, if you are living in God's will, he has created and he can see a beautiful, whole, priceless reality that maybe you can't see. In your marriage, in your family, in your relationship, in your friends, and what you're called to do. And even if you've never seen this dream fully that God has called you to, even if you haven't had one solid, wonderful moment, if God has seen it, if he's called that out for you, then you have to believe it and trust it and cherish it and allow yourself to be transformed. Now, mostly we don't change because we don't want to do the hard work or we're comfortable or we're afraid of changing and we like the status quo. We say, oh, better the devil we know, but we believe the distortion instead of the truth. Pretty much most of us, if not all of us, believe in the power of words to shape a person. We've been told that if a person is raised being told that they're stupid or ugly or unwanted or lazy or whatever, that we internalize those words. And then we live as if we're stupid or unlovable or whatever. We all know this. Words have power if we let them. Even more so, so much more so, is the power of the word, God's word. We chose the song immediately before the scripture this morning, not by accident. Ancient words, ever true, we just sang, changing me, changing you. It's amazing to stand and think of the power of those words that we just sang. The life-affirming, believing, hoping, counting on that these words will change us and change others. And so how? You pray for God to illuminate just one area of your life, one small place to stand in a new way. And then you ask us or another Christian friend into that change to pray, to hold you accountable, and also to show you God's grace. And you believe in the electrifying knock your socks off power of the Holy Spirit. It is a process. We believe in those words that say, God, I'm not what all that I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I once was. And we hear the word and they change us. And so we shake off the dust and we walk out of our history and we quit being an indifferent, self-absorbed parody of the car or caricature of the person that God created us to be. We hear and we call you to hear the life-changing words that you are blessed, that there is nothing that you can't do, that in all things, God gives you the power. Nothing is impossible for God. And he says, you are blessed, and you are mine, and to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Right. Please join me in the affirmation from Romans 8. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
and now receive this benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Amen.